Hey, this is Gloria again, the pink haired investor realtor in Indianapolis. And I've got my Margella. Uh, I'm sorry, I mess up your last name every single time. Mike Margarella on the, on the line with me today. And we're going to kind of go in depth a little bit more on his project that he called affectionately called the Little Hammy Project. So we're going <laughs> to kind of talk a, a little bit about some of the numbers, some of the successes, some of the failures and challenges you had along the way. So we'll just kind of dig in a little bit. So, so tell us about the Little Hammy Project, um, how you got started first. Let's, let's start with how you, how you actually acquired it. Yeah, sure. So I sourced it uh, through you and your team. So it was an on-market property that you guys uh, blasted out in your hot properties email. And uh, I thought it looked interesting based on the location and the numbers. So I reached out to you. I reached out to Charles and we had some conversations about it. Uh, we put in an asking price offer of 100000 and that was accepted. So and basically, for those of you that don't know, our hot properties email is something that um, I and my team do where we're trying to be proactive with things that come on the MLS. So, so these are the ones that are on market. And what we do is we evaluate everything that comes on the market the day it comes on. If it's something that we think works for a lot of our investors, we will go out there, record it, run the analysis on it, um, figure out what the rents are, what the ARVs are, what the area looks like, give a little bit of comments about the neighborhood, and then we blast that out to our investor list. So that's what our hot properties list is. So, so yeah, and it's we super did. helpful. Yep, it's and super then, helpful because at a, as an out-of-state investor, you know, you're not local on the ground, um, and, and even those folks who you know have access to the MLS or Redfin or Zillow, uh, you know, you might not always have the time to catch a property um, with a W two job or whatnot. And and this is a property that actually came on the market. I believe it was a Saturday, so it was probably. Uh, I think it was a day where I probably wouldn't have caught it. So um, it's a really valuable service. And then at the same time too, and I don't remember exactly the days that we did it, but by us getting out there faster, you could you could make a decision faster and we're able to be one of the first offers in there. So I think that's why we got it because you were so quick of, yeah, let's get an offer in and see how it goes. So, um, so we got it under contract. Um, had inspectors so I don't remember on that one that one we kind of mutually had an inspector that we liked right that we picked yeah. on that one um yeah, we so used, I had uh, Markham. Markham so we had a list and basically Mike picked off the list of which one he wanted sometimes on those it's like whoever the first available inspector out is out there um inspection wasn't too bad there were a few little things that popped up do you remember on the inspection what kind of stuff popped up yeah, there was some patching that we needed to do, uh, some gutter stuff. Uh, the mechanicals were in pretty good shape. The foundation was in good shape. Uh, the electrical was in good shape. We did have to do some plumbing work. So that's something that we did get a price reduction on. So I believe we actually got it under contract for, for about 105. And then we got it down to 100 after inspection response. Yep, that's right. And then we got some contractors in there to get you some bids. So how was that process? Yeah, it was good. So I actually only used uh, one contractor to go out there. I, I basically told him uh, it was the first time I worked with him. And, you know, I, I knew a lot about his work. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to work with him moving forward. So I told him, hey, I'm, I'm not just sending you out there to, to get me a scope. Like, uh, this is our project. Like, let's do it. Um, you know, I'm not using your, your scope to bid against somebody else or, or whatever. So I said, um, let's just move forward. So um, I think that worked out pretty well. And I, and I think it does help too when you're honest and upfront with them, you know, they, they know what they need to do. So I think I actually met, so the contractor he chose was Josh Jenkins with Jenkins Property Solutions. And I actually met Josh on site that day and we were kind of walking around, I remember. And it was at the time only a 3-1 and we were just kind of going through, kind of talking about finishes as, of what would be best for the area for, for finishing up. And he's like, I think I can add an extra bathroom. I'm like, yeah, what, what, what are you thinking here? And we had walked into the front porch and it was a pretty big front porch that was kind of unused space. He's like, right here. He's like, I think that like we could cut this in half and we could put a bathroom off of the master bedroom. So then we walked down in the basement to kind of look at the plumbing. He's like, eh, I don't know if I can get this to work because it's a pretty long line and we have to have exactly the right slope. So when Josh came back to you with that idea, what were you thinking there? Yeah, we were pretty pumped about that because I think that's something that Charles actually mentioned in, in his initial walkthrough video too. And, you know, we had obviously seen the comps and we knew adding at least a half bath um, would help a lot. And, uh, 
you know, we were really excited that Josh was was able to make that work. And, and we were actually able to add a full bath. So we added a full master with a standing shower, a barn door. So I, I think it came out awesome. And I think that really helped on the resale. So what were some of the, um, during the construction process, what were some of the challenges that, that kind of popped up along the way? Uh, we didn't run into anything too unexpected on the actual rehab. Um, I'd say the one thing that we learned and, and the one uh, challenge that we faced was, I, I don't think we budgeted enough time or money to the uh, exterior of the house. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. we, we, you know, the curb appeal was fine. Uh, we did end up taking down like a chain, chain link fence right in front of that, the property, which I think helped quite a bit. Um, but if we could do it over again, we probably would have painted the exterior, um, maybe thrown a nicer front door on it and just puffed it up from there. Yeah. So I remember, so at that point, Mike and Marie were here and they met me over at the property and we locked, walked inside. It's all gorgeous. We refinished the hardwood floors, all nice neutral gray paints and the white trim. The bathrooms obviously look good. We completely gutted the kitchen and put, I mean, honestly, we put stock cabinets in, but they were the nice white ones. Um, and then we put butcher, butcher box countertops, right? Yep. But then, so it was all great. And then we like, we're standing outside in front of the house and Mike and Marie and I were like, eh, it needs something. This just isn't, it's just kind of blah. It was, you know, just white. So we did paint the door gray and we did the trim over the top of it a little bit. And then we put a window box and some shutters just to kind of spruce it up. But yeah, it, like we got to that point and I think you guys were at your budget and we're like, it is what it is. Let's just try it out and see. So then we went ahead and listed it. Um, so we got a stager. So that I think helped a lot, you know, for the initial, at least getting those pictures out there. And then we put it on the market. The house across the street sold for 240 there is literally eight houses on Mike's block that were being built or renovated. And there's some of those houses that were, you know, going to be sold for like 400, 450,000. So I thought, oh yeah, you know, we're great. We're in good shape. We put it on the market for 250 and then wah, wah, wah. I mean, it just kind of died for a little bit. So, so tell us about kind of like we put it on there, didn't sell it right away. What were you kind of thinking at that point? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the block is awesome. And that's one of the things that really attracted us to the project, just because there were so many rehabs on that block. Uh, so, so this property is located right in the Willard Park pocket. Uh, so it's definitely a transitioning neighborhood. But this block in particular was, was awesome. I mean, not only are there rehabs similar to the ones that we did, but there's also brand new builds, as you said. So um, if we could go back, maybe we would, we would look into even adding a level and, and trying to get up to that ARV. But uh, for this one, we, we stayed somewhat small and we got in and out quick. Um, but as far as the list price goes, you know, we knew we listed it aggressive and we mm -hmm. had conversations about that. And fortunately, we didn't have a whole lot of holding costs that were uh, preventing us from trying to go for top dollar. So, so we did try to go for top dollar and um, we didn't get any offers at that price because it was, it was definitely overpriced. The comp that we used mm -hmm. across the street, um, it was just studs up rebuild. Uh, it was similar square footage and, and we thought that maybe we could get that, but, um, but it turned out we couldn't. So, so it's out on the market for, for a few weeks and uh, we did, you know, a price reduction before we finally got it sold. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely a lesson that, um, you know, beware of listing at the top of market and, and maybe it's better to list just a bit lower and, you know, if it really is worth top of market, uh, the buyers will hopefully bid it up. Yep. And just so, you, so, so our, our people watching this know, I mean, Mike and I had tons of conversations about this. And it's like, what are we going to do? You know, are we going to go high? And we're like, you know what? It doesn't hurt. Let's again, because the holding costs are so low, we're like, let's go ahead and put it up there high and see what happens with the caveat that we know we may have to, you know, reduce it a little bit. And I remember, yeah. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I was going to say, um, you know, the comp across the street that we used, it actually sold the day of our inspection on Hamilton. So yeah. we had actually underwritten it for actually $5,000 less than we ended up selling it for. So right. we, we did fine on the sale and it sold right where we thought it should. Um, but we just got a little greedy based on that yeah. one comp that sold the day of our inspection. Exactly. Got excited. And I don't know if you remember this conversation, but I think it was before we even purchased it the first time when I was trying to explain the neighborhood to you. I told you that two blocks west of here, there's houses selling for $400,000. 
two blocks east of here, there's drug deals happening on the corner. So it yeah. literally like there's this line that's kind of coming across and you were right at that line. And we knew that going in that it was going to be risky, but I mean, risk kind of paid off for you. So, um, so then, um, it had been sitting, I think we were like at 38 days or something like that. And we'd been having lots of conversations. What do we do? We had several open houses. Um, we had tons of showings the whole time. We had showings constantly. So like if we would have stopped showings, I'd be like, okay, something's wrong with it. And then we look at the feedback, but the feedback was so all over the place where love the street, hate the house, love the house, hate the street, love the yard, can't stand the yard, want the bigger, I love the bigger garage, don't really like that. I mean, it was just all like every single one would come back opposite. So a little bit of frustrating there, but we got to like, like 38, 40 days, something like that. And Mike and I were having conversations and you sent me an email that said, you know what? My property manager is coming over to see it. We're going to just take it off, see if we can rent it. So tell me your thought process at that point. Yeah, I mean, one of the good things about this property was I felt like with the finishes that we used and, and the street that we were on, that we would have some pretty good short-term rental potential. So we did some diligence on that and we figured, hey, if, if you know we use this as a short-term rental for a year or two, we'll let the neighborhood keep coming up. These beautiful houses on the block are, you know, gonna gonna finish off, and uh, hopefully buyers will flock to it, and we'll get an even higher price in a couple of years. So, um, if we if we didn't get what we initially underwrote the property for, that was going to be our plan, and and we were still above that on our list price, um, but we just didn't want to keep doing price reductions and just let it sit vacant on the market. So uh, I sent you an email, and I said, okay, let's take it off the market. You know, tomorrow I'm going to start the process of getting it getting it set for a short-term rental and then you said hold up you know we have uh, we have full price offer so uh so that worked out really well and it was super ironic how it worked out and we got got a great buyer who um worked right around right around the corner i think at a school there so he was very familiar with the neighborhood and he wanted to be a part of the transition and and gaining some equity in this property in the long run so uh so yeah that was uh that was that was pretty awesome yeah. So, and it was like, I remember I was like standing in a grocery store with my phone in my hand. I'm like, wait, wait, it's coming in. <laughs> so it's like, I was like trying to communicate with everybody. It was all like happening. It was like, no, we're good. We have an offer. You don't have to worry about it. So that was kind of exciting that, you know, cause I was thinking the same thing that, you know, and it honestly would have made a perfect Airbnb. It was, it was a cute little house for an Airbnb. So yeah, it had a huge garage too, which was something that initially attracted us to the project, a huge I think it's two and a half on the on the garage size. Right. So we were thinking about even maybe making that like half game room or something for the for the Airbnb. So, uh, but we were very happy to to sell it for what we what we thought we could. Yeah, and then honestly, like that side of the transaction really didn't go too badly. I mean, we had he wanted to do extra inspections, which was fine, not a problem. We had a couple little things that we kind of negotiated back and forth, but at the end of the day, we actually ended up you know selling it for two fifteen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were, we initially underwrote it and we thought, we thought the ARV was going to be about 210. So like I said, we actually came in over that despite, um, you know, listing it uh, a little too aggressively. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, that side of the transaction wasn't too onerous. Uh, you know, he, he did want some extra uh, sewer inspections, which, uh, which took some time, but we, we were able to close on time, which was great. And uh, the buyer was, was willing to work with us on, with all our vendors and uh, all worked out well. Yeah. So what, what was your biggest takeaway from the Little Hammy project? Yeah, the, the biggest takeaway is probably to list a little more conservatively and just let the buyers bid up to what it's worth. So even now, as we're analyzing deals, we're, we're analyzing them on a, on a bit more of a conservative ARV than, than we normally would. And like I said, uh, we did that on this project, but I think we just listed it a little higher than we initially thought we would. Um, but now as we're analyzing deals, it's, it's a lesson that we've definitely learned uh, to be a little, little more conservative or even more conservative than, than we are. Um, and also just to pay a little more attention to the, to the curb appeal. Yep. Yep. So um, if you're talking to an investor that he really was thinking coming in, doing buy and holds, like you said, the market's not, you know, always right for that. Um, what would you say to someone that wants to take the plunge and go ahead and try to do a flip? Yeah, I mean, it's not a whole lot different than a burr. I mean, you're still obviously buying it and you're still rehabbing it. So the only, the main difference, I guess, is that you're not renting it out or refinancing it. You're just selling it. So uh, it's fairly similar in, in setting up your, 
your uh, systems, which is kind of how I looked at it. And, uh, you know, I didn't think that this one would work for a burr or a rental, uh, or at least a long-term rental. Um, so, I, you know, I just wanted to get our systems moving basically and, and start working with people that we wanted to work with. So um, I, I think if you're having issues finding buy and holds that work just because maybe the rent rates aren't keeping up with the ARVs, um, I think at least flipping to start out isn't a bad idea. And it doesn't have to be a home run flip where you make, you know, 50,000, like you see some of these other folks making, you know, even if you just get started and you make 10, 20,000, and of course, underwrite for some, uh, for anything that could go wrong. But um, if you're just getting on base by doing that, I think that's a, a great way to start. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking time with us today. Go ahead and give out your information so that um, people know how to reach you and, and kind of follow your future projects. Yeah, so we have a, a pretty big social media presence. You can find us at Next Play Investments on Facebook and Instagram, Bigger Pockets, uh, also under our personal names, uh, Mike and Marie. And then you could feel free to reach out to us at nextplayinvestments at gmail.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for being with us today, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you.